morning. My name is Richard Wesley, and it has been my privilege these past nine years to be the pastor here at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. Um, most of you may be aware by now that today will be my last Sunday, um, and that comes with a mixed amount of sorrow for me with uh, leaving St. Bethlehem, but it has been nine years and I have enjoyed being your pastor. I'm, gl I'm glad you're here today. The Bible story that we have is, a, is an exciting uh, story out of the life of Jesus that could take so many directions. We'll talk more about that in a little while. But again, I'm glad you're here. Now I'm going to ask Margaret if she will come and talk about that covenant relationship that you as a community of faith are forging with your new pastor, Margaret. Congregational fruitfulness requires the mutual commitment of clergy and laity to the centrality of the church's primary mission. And we adopt this covenant as an expression of our mutual commitment to the vital ministry as we seek to faithfully make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Our um, statement today is conflict resolution. Conflict is inevitable and it's not a sign of failure. We will manage conflict in healthy ways. We will not deal with anonymous complaints Individuals in conflict will speak directly with one another. So, looking forward to our new minister coming, we know that there could be conflicts, and it's inevitable, but we will deal with it in healthy ways. Thank you.
week's gospel lesson comes from the book of Mark. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can tr be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, He has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. As is often the case, there is a lot of information in these few short verses that could call, uh, call out for our attention to center on this morning. I mean, we could look at the verses where Jesus' family appears to try and rescue Jesus. We could examine the implied message of who is inside with Jesus and who is outside. Some of you may recall from our Bible studies in Mark's gospel that this is one of the techniques that Mark employs throughout this gospel story. Well, we could talk about his mother and brothers and sister and the cultural context of Jesus' response that those who do the will of the Father are his mother and brothers and sisters. We could keep all of this in its first century cultural context and, and ask how would people in a shame-honor system view Jesus' failure to acknowledge his mother and even seemingly to suggest that others are better at being his family? We could spend all of our time fleshing out what it means when Jesus says, Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness. In fact, this one has the potential of being so misunderstood that I feel that I should at least address it. God's grace comes to us in three distinctly different ways. Now, John Wesley called these provenient grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. Provenient grace can be described as God's finding you before you love God. Any desire you may harbor to know God or to be curious about God in whatever view or concept you may have is provenient grace. Grace is channeled to us through God's Holy Spirit. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to reject, turn your back on, or turn against the Holy Spirit. And there is no forgiveness while you're rejecting God's love offered to you. There is no forgiveness as long as you are walking away from God. The word repent simply means to turn and go the other direction. And forgiveness is only possible when you repent, when you turn 
And when you turn, you stop blaspheming or walking away from God and you begin to go the other way, which is toward God. So every sin committed while your lifestyle is living toward God will be forgiven. But there is no forgiveness while your lifestyle is lived in opposition to God. But the moment you repent, the moment you turn and begin living toward God, you are forgiven because you stop blaspheming the Holy Spirit. This is where provenient grace helps us in our understanding. You have no desire to repent, no desire to live toward God until God calls you. We call that provenient grace. So if you desire God, if you are even curious about God, and the things of God. You can stop blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You can turn and you can live into God. I, I point this out because I've actually had some people in some of my churches who, who thought they had somehow um, said something or, or did something that caused God to never allow them back into God's forgiving grace. They thought they had blasphemed the Holy Spirit and could never be forgiven. So, so simply put, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not something a 10-year-old boy can do at the playground on a double dog dare. Now, I do want to spend some time this morning with this story where Jesus talks about a kingdom divided against itself. Listen carefully as we revisit the wording in this story. Listen to how Mark phrases this. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, Jesus has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And Jesus called to him, and spoke to them in parables. Now, notice this is a parable. He said, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. I think it's important to notice in here what Jesus does not say. Have you ever heard someone say, well, a house divided cannot stand? Or maybe you've heard that song, United we stand and divided we fall. Well, notice this is not what Jesus said. In fact, three times Jesus says something very clearly different. Listen to it again. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. To be divided, to have different opinions, is to be human. Have you ever noticed how diverse all of creation is? Look at the wonderful variety of plant life on this planet. Notice how diverse the, the animal kingdom is. That's because God loves diversity. And this really shouldn't surprise us that God created humanity with a huge amount of diversity. In fact, we could postulate that to be divided is to be who God created us to be. 
differences and different opinions are not the cause of destruction or permanent failure. It is never wrong to have different opinions. In fact, having different opinions and the freedom to express those different opinions is a sign of maturity and health. When people are in a situation where there is no freedom to express different opinions, is where you quite frequently will find mental abuse and often physical abuse. Now, there's nothing wrong with having two or more political parties in a nation. I frequently entertain the idea that having three active, viable political parties would offer the opportunity for optimal political health in a republic such as ours. Having three political platforms offers possibilities of healthy balance that is found only in triangles. Now, those of you who participated in the Healthy Congregations workshops that we had and sponsored here at St. Bethlehem, you understand that triangles are normal and healthy until they're not, until they're abused. Political diversity is healthy for a country. There is nothing evil about a husband and a wife having a disagreement. Healthy marriages learn how to navigate differences of opinion. Differences of opinion offer opportunities for growth and health and bonding and deeper understanding. There is nothing amiss when friends are divided on situations and issues. Friends who are aligned in every option are functioning in typical cult-like behaviors. Healthy friendships are fueled by differences. Of course, there are similarities that friendships are centered around and built on, but even in those similarities, you notice a range of divided opinions. And all of this is healthy. All of this is normal. All of this is the way God has created us. There is absolutely nothing anti-God for a denomination to disagree with major denomination changing positions. The United Methodist Church is currently debating a wide range of opinions over human sexuality, and well, we should. Now, a divided nation or a divided family or a divided church or any group faces the possibility of long-range, serious problems, including complete breakdown, if those with different opinions refuse to listen to each other. This is called a nation divided against itself. Against itself itself. Jesus did not say a house divided cannot stand. Jesus did not say a kingdom divided cannot stand. Jesus said a house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus said a kingdom, which is a nation, a kingdom or nation divided against itself cannot stand. And there's a big difference in these two phrases. A house divided against itself is a house where only one opinion can be tolerated. A nation divided against itself is a political atmosphere where disagreeing with my position makes you my enemy. A church divided against itself is in danger of collapse. But God loves our diversity. So why don't we? Is it because we no longer love what God loves? You know, last Sunday 
in the in-person worship service, we sang a song that has these words. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity will one day be restored and they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Our unity is our love for each other and for all humanity or humankind. Love demands that we listen and hear each other in our differences. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word, and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour your Holy Spirit out on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen.
And now with confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. One of the practices that comes out of the rich heritage of being Methodist is our adherence to uh, liturgical ways to welcome and say goodbye to pastors through our appointment process. We will practice that this morning with a liturgical order of farewell. I thank you, the members and friends of St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church for the love and support you have shown me while I have ministered among you. I am grateful for the ways my leadership has been accepted. I ask forgiveness for the mistakes I have made. As I leave, I carry with me all that I have learned here. We receive your thankfulness, offer forgiveness, and accept that you now leave to minister at the Bethel Woodlawn Charge of the United Methodist Church. We express our gratitude for your time among us. We ask your forgiveness for our mistakes. Your influence on our faith and faithfulness will not leave us with your departure. I accept your gratitude and forgiveness. I forgive you, trusting that our time together and our parting are pleasing to God. I release you from turning to me and depending on me. I encourage your continuing ministry here and will pray for you and for your new pastor, Reverend Corey Alexander Willett. Now, let us pray. Eternal God, whose steadfast love for us is from everlasting to everlasting, we give you thanks for cherished memories and commend one another into your care as we move in new directions. 
Keep us one in your love forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. stood here and said, Today, our faces and mannerisms are unfamiliar, but as the days turn into weeks, and the weeks turn into months, and the months turn into years, we will grow to recognize, love, respect each other. Today, we bear witness of our journey of nine years years. We have laughed together and we have cried together. We have shared joys and sorrow. We have faced successes and challenges together. Together we have experienced God. I will always treasure the memory of our journey. I will no longer be your pastor but I will always be your friend. No longer being your pastor means I will not be available for baptisms, weddings, or funerals. Baptisms, weddings, and funerals are the most effective ways congregations and pastors enter satisfying and lasting relationships. This is also the opportunity for your pastor to minister to your extended family members. Now, you will continue to be in my thoughts 
and my prayers always.